All right, if you take your Bible, turn over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You find your place there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I do appreciate, again, you working with us, especially those of you that are in the overflow room, helping us out with the space and getting to spread out a little bit. We are getting closer every week on our building, and we trust that things will stay on schedule there. And before we know it, if Jesus tarries, hopefully we'll be in there and be able to solve some of these space problems and uh, be able to move out, and that is a blessing. I appreciate your... Uh, not uh, waning during this time. Our, our attendance has not gone down. It's been going up, which causes a problem, but we like the problem. We're glad that you're faithful and uh, glad that you're here. So we trust that that'll be something that'll be short-lived as far as our uh, being a little cramped, but I do appreciate, again, your help with it. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. We looked at first Thess- or the first chapter of this Second Thessalonians two weeks ago, and I'm not going to take time to review because I'm confident if I ask, you pretty well got everything I said that, that, that week. But, I, but we'll tie that in to this chapter. So let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and then we'll begin. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to look at your word this morning. Lord, whatever we open up in this book and read, we know that it's helpful and profitable and challenging. But we pray especially this morning for this portion that, Lord, you may give us an understanding, that you may warm our hearts, that you may encourage every believer that you might challenge the person who doesn't know Christ, that everything we do would honor his name and that we might leave today closer to you, more like you than when we left. We thank you for what we'll do and how you'll work, and we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and you'll notice down in verse 1, the Bible says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. You know, these people, no doubt, were troubled. We know in 1 Thessalonians, they had a certain uh, element of trouble, and uh, Paul had, had wrote to encourage them that their dead relatives, of course, were going to be taken care of, and that the dead in Christ would rise first, and then we which are alive were going to be called up, and he had dealt with that truth, and undoubt taught them many things. Then we come over shortly after to the book of 2 Thessalonians, as I mentioned last week, in the first chapter, Paul told them, you are going through a heavy persecution, you're going through a deep trouble, but he says, you who are troubled, rest with us. The Lord Jesus is going to be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. You know, we live in a day right now where if you know the Lord Jesus and you believe this book and you're a citizen in this country, there is cause for concern. Churches are being shut down, there is being um, rights taken away that we would think would be important to us as believers, and if we're really watching and we're listening, certainly from a human standpoint, we could become troubled. I mean, yes, there are people today, this week, I got an email from a pastor in California who has been fined for months for having services. He's violating the, quote, law every week by meeting together. These fines are adding up. Right now, they're merely fines. Before long, it could well be imprisonment. And yes, we could be frustrated from a standpoint of believers in a constitution that we have uh, no law that should be ever uh, made to prohibit the free exercise of religion. We believe in our uh, study of this book and understanding of the Christian religion, which from uh, the world standpoint is all it is, but we understand from that constitutionally we're supposed to be able to meet because we're believers. But I dare say today we have a greater mandate than a constitution. We have a command from God to serve Him, to put Him first, and hopefully that never happens. Hopefully the government doesn't step in and make us make that choice, but when the choice comes, we obey God rather than men. Now, the fact that we are placed in that position, that we would have to make that kind of decision, certainly could cause us some trouble. But I assure you that in the first century, these Christians were facing persecution beyond a fine. Great things were happening. There was deep persecution against believers. And the question came to their mind, and there's a reason for that question, was I wonder if we're living in the end times. You know, if I've heard that question once, I've heard it eight or ten times in the last several months, do you think we might be living in the end times? 
Well, the fact is we are living in the last days. The last days have been taking place ever since the resurrection of Christ, and times are perilous, and we recognize that certainly times do wax worse and worse, and the only hope that this world has is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But in a very unique way, we're wondering today, could we be closer? Are these signs, are these things taking place that Jesus is about to come? Well, I'll tell you, the exhortation we have from the Scripture as believers is just look for him every day, and he won't overtake us as a thief. We know that he could come at any moment. But what happened to these believers is somebody had stepped in. In the midst of their trouble, in the midst of their difficulty, there was evidently someone who had stepped in and had said, the reason all of you are going through this is the day of the Lord has come. The tribulation period has come on this earth. Those things that Paul taught us would come when Jesus uh, took us out. They're coming on this earth, and there was perplexity in their mind for their thought, we didn't think we were going to go through this. Well, now, chapter 2, Paul clears this up in a very real way. He clears up this idea that they as believers would still be here when the Antichrist would come and the judgment would come on this earth. He clears it up, and he is going to make that as we go through this chapter, but I want to approach it from this way. Because what we find out in this chapter is he is explaining to them where believers stand and where the world stands. The question arises, what would happen if you missed the rapture? Now, if you don't like the term rapture, some people say, well, the word rapture is not in the Bible. It came from a Latin word based on the call away of 1 Thessalonians 4. If you want to call it the catching up, then we'll call it that. If you want to call it the uh, gathering together, as is mentioned in this epistle. The fact is, Jesus promised in John 14, he is coming for his own. And I think rapture is a good word if we know what it means, but certainly he is coming to receive us to himself before he comes back to this earth to take over. Now, I, as a believer, am encouraged by that, but what will happen if you miss the rapture? Well, he addresses three things in this chapter that I want to approach. Now, we could get bogged down in some of the prophetical elements that are mentioned here. We'll mention them in passing. But I want to look at it from a practical standpoint as he addresses these different people. I want you to notice, first of all, that Paul talks to the delivered. Now, that's the believer. Because if you'll notice in verse 1, again, he says, We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Now, surely there will be a day when Jesus is coming back to this earth, and every eye shall see him. He will stand on the Mount of Olives. He will not be here to make peace. He will make, be, be here to destroy the forces of the Antichrist and set up a kingdom. But he beseeches them by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but that second element, by our gathering together unto him. That's not just his coming here, but our going there. And he's not talking about the gate of death. He knows from the previous book that he wrote to these Thessalonians, they understood fully. He is talking about the day when Jesus will come to take his own. He encourages the deliverers, first of all, that they are going to be gathered unto him. But he says to them in verse 2, I wrote that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. You know, the first thing I know Paul was writing to encourage them about was the persecution, the difficulty, the times that were going on around them. Now, let me tell you today, we're going through some difficult times. We are facing some things that are unusual. I don't know how often I've heard the word unprecedented in the last year. I guess I've heard it an unprecedented amount of times. But everything we're seeing, man, we've never seen this before. This is unique. This is interesting. And all that may be. We know the world already, before this took place, this got the world's attention. We would already be able to stand and certainly say amen to the Bible when it says, in the last days, perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Certainly we live in times where we have to stop and say, boy, things are bad, but listen, if you think things are bad now, you wait till Jesus takes this church out. There is going to be a time to come on this earth that's described in the book of Revelation, which the world has never seen when the birth pains of the earth begin to unfold, and a judgment falls on this earth, and he wrote and he encouraged, and he said to them, listen, there is going to be some trouble in this world, but don't be shaken. 
That reminds me of what Jesus said in John 16, 33. He said, in the world, you shall have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus prayed for us in John 17, and he said, Father, I pray not, in verse 15, that thou wouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Hey, God would have us live in this evil world as a testimony to his grace and power, as a testimony to what he can do to a sinner who was once lost, who trusted Jesus and now been saved. He has a message to the delivered. Listen to Galatians chapter 1 verse 4. Who gave himself for our sin, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. You know why Jesus went to the cross? He went to the cross to deliver us from this evil world. You know how he did that? He took my sin upon himself. Now, I live in a world where there's all kinds of people who have no real uh, regard for the truth. The Bible says in Revelation 21, 8, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I'll guarantee you, if I look back at my own life, and you probably could as well, I could certainly see times where I didn't have regard for the truth. I didn't pay attention to the truth. I didn't tell the truth. And the Bible says, I'm not to bear false witness. As a liar, I have my part in a lake which burns with fire and brimstone. Thank God Jesus came, died on the cross, and bore my lying heart on the cross. He took my sin upon that cross. And though I live in the midst of people who have no regard for the truth, he came to deliver me from a present evil world. We could go on down the line talking about different sins, but the bottom line is Jesus bore my sin in his own body on the tree. He made it possible for me to be delivered. Now, he says to these people, don't be shaken, but then notice this phrase, or be troubled. Now, notice the different things that might trouble them. Neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now, herein was the problem. Somebody had stepped in and was trying to deceive these people from Thessalonica, trying to make them believe something that would shake them off of trusting the Lord. Now, the devil can never, once you know the Lord Jesus Christ, he can never get your soul. When you're saved, you're in Christ forever, for all eternity, and the devil knows that. But he doesn't give up, wash his hands and say, well, I'll go try somebody else, can't do anything there. His desire is to discourage you. His desire is to get you to, to not live by faith. His desire is to get your focus off and to become uh, totally dependent on yourself so you're ineffective. Now, he came in here where God had started this wonderful church, and somebody came in and started saying, hey, I'm a prophet by spirit. Now, they did allow prophets in that day. The Bible was not finished, and there were men that God literally used to give the Word of God before the New Testament was finished, and he had ways of authorizing that, but some false prophets had come in. There's always been false prophets, hasn't there? The Bible says in 2 Peter 2, 1, there were also false prophets among the people, and many shall follow their pernicious ways. There are still false prophets today. He says, don't be shaken by a false prophet who says, I have a spirit to tell me this. He says, don't be shaken by somebody who has a word, that is, a word of knowledge. That took place in that day. And then he says, even by a letter that is from us. You know, no doubt somebody had written a letter and had said the day of Christ is at hand. Paul is actually, I believe, quoting them verbatim, which is, if you're familiar with this passage, you know there's a little controversy about the wording here. I'm not going to get into that. But I believe it's because Paul was quoting the writer who had erroneously written and said, the day of Christ is at hand, he said, don't even believe a letter if I sign it, if it goes against what the Word of God teaches. You know, Galatians chapter 1 and verse 7, Paul wrote to the Galatians and he says, I marvel that you are so removed from the grace of Christ into another gospel, which is not another. He said, but there be some that would trouble you and pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, you could have wrote that in this morning's newspaper because there's still people that would trouble you and pervert the gospel of Christ. He says in the next verse, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. He didn't say just pat him on the back, tell him to go his way. He said, let him be damned. He's an enemy of God. 
Now understand that in this day, some enemy of God had stood up and said, I want to discourage these believers. I want them to think that because they're going through trouble, they're going through difficulty, I'm going to make them think they're already going through the tribulation. They have no hope, and the devil would love to take away your hope, but if you have Jesus, he can't take your hope. Now Paul said, don't be shaken. Don't be troubled. He he said, you are going to be delivered from the present times. You're going to be delivered from the trouble of false prophets. And ultimately, he says, you're going to be delivered from the tribulation. Notice the implication clear in verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day that he's talking about here, when the tribulation will come on this earth, shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed. Now, those will take place simultaneously. He says it won't come. Now, if Paul was simply writing to tell these people that it hadn't happened yet, but it's going to, that wouldn't have been much encouragement. He's clearly making the point to these believers, don't be troubled, don't be shaken. It hadn't happened. It can't happen until this happens, and you won't be here. That's the point. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. So I'm encouraged as I read this and I see that uh, somebody, perhaps Paul warns before this chapter's over, they might miss the rapture, but thank God it will not be the person who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, when Jesus comes, I'm not going to have to make sure I'm looking in the right direction. I'm not going to have to make sure the time on the clock is right or that I've got things in order. If I know Jesus, I am in him. And when he comes, he comes for his own. I'm just waiting. If I happen to be taken by surprise, I'm still going because he's coming for his own. So he says, first of all, to the delivered. Well, then he discusses, secondly, the deceiver. Now, this deceiver is a person. Notice what he says about the deceiver again in verse 3. Now, I read the first part of that verse, but notice he says that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in this time. Now he's saying you won't be here when he is, and he's obviously not here. So let me tell you a little bit about him. Now this is not uh, a, a, a former emperor of Rome. Some people thought for a long time, maybe he's talking about some emperor that was going to come along. This man is clearly revealed in other parts of the Bible to be none other than, as he says, the man of sin. So I notice here he mentions a man, and he says this man is going to be revealed after the church is gone. Now, what do I know about this man? Well, if you could turn quickly, you can hold your place here. I want you to turn to Daniel chapter 11, because this man was actually prophesied about many years earlier and described explicitly in the book of Revelation as well. But look over to the book of Daniel, if you can. Daniel chapter 11. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Hezekiah, Daniel. Okay? When you find Daniel chapter 11, look over to verse 36. He's speaking here prophetically, and he says, The king shall do according to his will. This is a king that that, uh, Daniel had had a dream, and it's being interpreted for him, and he's explaining, here's what that king is. The king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. That sounds a whole lot like what we just read in 2 Thessalonians. And shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that is determined that shall be done you'll see this tie into the other passage but here's what i want you to notice who is this person his identification neither shall he regard the god of his fathers nor the desire of women nor regard any god for he shall magnify himself above all but in his estate shall he honor the god of forces And a God whom his father knew not shall he honor with gold, silver, with precious stones, and pleasant things. Now this king that shall do according to his own will, we call him the Antichrist. He's the beast out of the earth of Revelation chapter 9. 
He is the man of sin. How do we know this was not just some emperor that was going to come along the way? Well, I don't want to get too bogged down in this, but I do want you to catch just the gist of this idea. But note back in 2 Thessalonians again, and notice that it says that he is the son of perdition. You know, if I were to go over to John chapter 17, Jesus begins to pray for his disciples. He prays for those whom thou hast given me. And he says in verse uh, 15 of that chapter, he says, Of all that thou hast given me have I lost none, except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now the son of perdition that he was referring to was Judas Iscariot, who was a definite person. Do you know Judas, of course, went out and hanged himself in Acts chapter 1, verse 25, uh, Peter gets up and he says, we need to pick another uh, disciple to take the place of Judas who fell by transgression. And he says, and went to his own place. Now, nobody owns hell. You go there as an outsider. But when Jesus, or when Judas went there, Jesus, of course, said he was the son of perdition. Now, Peter says he went to his own place. Judas Iscariot, Jesus looked at him and said, uh, one of you is a devil. The devil entered into Judas Iscariot. Do you know who this man of sin is? He's not just some ordinary man. I guess you could describe him as the devil incarnate. He is going to be the devil's man, not just some man who's been influenced by the devil, but literally, when we go to Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, there are three personages that we see. The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are. Now, this man, I'm making the point, is a definite person. You know, for a long time, ever since I've been a kid, and I'm sure before that, people have been trying to recognize who the Antichrist is going to be. I remember back in 1980-ish, somewhere that, I was, um, I don't know, I was pretty young then, uh, but back in 1980, Ronald Reagan was up for election, and probably after he was elected, well, you know, his name is Ronald Wilson Reagan. Ronald, Wilson, and Reagan have six letters, and 666 is the mark of the beast. So no doubt Ronald Reagan is going to be the Antichrist, and that was a big deal back when I was a kid. I mean, 666, obviously it's got to be him. And you've heard the similar type things where people try to pick out some personages, and they say, boy, he must be the Antichrist. Now let me tell you something about the Antichrist. He's going to be well-loved by the world, highly respected, going to deceive everybody. Nobody's going to see any bad in him. Somebody says, could Donald Trump be the Antichrist? Nobody who has ever been as hated, as bad as that man is hated, has any chance of being the Antichrist. Now you understand that this man will be a definite person. He is identified clearly. Not to be too detailed this morning, but you understand it says he is going to uh, reject the God of his fathers. Almost for sure he's going to be a Jew. It says he'll not regard women. Now, that could mean that he has no regard for uh, women because they were looking for the Christ. They've, some have read that deeply into it. I, I dare say it could be that he's a homosexual. Right. It also says that he's going to neither regard uh, women and uh, he's going to claim that he is God himself. I believe he's going to be a secular humanist Jew who basically comes up and says, we're done with the God of the Bible. I am God. I can cure your diseases. I can tell you how to get rid of all these problems. Listen, he might not come for years. I don't know when Jesus is coming, but if he came today and a man stepped up and said, none of these cures are working, this mask won't do the trick, but I'm going to personally take care of it, and he came up with a way that businesses could open, masks could be gone, do you think folks would follow him? I mean, or bring up some other issue. I get rid of all the wars. I'll, I'll handle all of this stuff. He is going to be a person that is going to have the ability to do great things. He's identified. He is the man of sin. He is a man. He is a, a deceiver. But then notice this, his restraint. And now, all right, he goes back to the believer to encourage him. Now, what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time? Why doesn't he go ahead and show up? He's asking this rhetorical question to the believers. You're wondering if, he's, if you're in the middle of the tribulation, no, the man of sin's not being revealed. Well, why doesn't he reveal himself? Verse 7 answers. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth, you understand the word let meant hinder in 1611. So you read it as hinder. He who now hinders will hinder 
until he be taken out of the way. What is the hindering influence from keeping the Antichrist from revealing himself? It isn't because he doesn't want to. It's not because the devil wouldn't love to go ahead and take over. It's not because he wouldn't love to step in and say, now's my time. But for 2,000 years, he has been restrained, not by an it, but by a he. He who now hinders. He that is stopping him will hinder him until he, the hinderer, is taken out of the way. You know who that hinderer is? He is a person. That person is the Holy Spirit of God. God is hindering him in the person of the Holy Spirit. And where does the Holy Spirit live? He lives in the church. Do you realize when he is taken out of the way, there's only one way the Holy Spirit is going to be, quote, taken out of the way, and that's when Jesus comes to take his bride out of the way. And when he does, there is no more hindering influence. See, he says this deceiver is going to be a definite person. He is restrained. But then notice in verse 8. Then shall that wicked be revealed. As soon as the Holy Spirit's taken out, that wicked. And the idea here is not an, uh, an adjective. This is a noun, the wicked one. It's the person he's talking about. Then shall that wicked person be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. I love when God mentions this and says, Christian, let me encourage you. Let me tell you that you're going to be gathered together unto him. Don't get concerned. That, none of that's going to take place until the man of sin be revealed. When he does, all of this stuff begins to unfold. And when you're going to be taken out, and this man's going to go, unless you believe that he's coming to take over, lest you think that we're just going to give the earth up and let the devil have it, and they're going to own this place, I'm telling you, he's only going to be here for a short time, and I'm going to destroy him with the brightness of my coming. His time is limited. It happens to be uh, seven years, we learn later in the Bible, but he's only going to be here for a short time. It's going to look like, to start with, he's taken over, but I'm coming to destroy him. As I mentioned, he'll be cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are. So he describes here not only his restraint, but his retribution. But you know, I don't just see as he describes here a man. By the way, we're not going to be here for believers, but what if you miss the rapture? You'll see this man. You'll recognize, you'll know, but you won't know he's the man of sin. Now, he doesn't just mention here a man. He mentions a mystery. Look at the mystery in verse 7. He says, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. You know the rhetorical question he asks, what withholds him till he be revealed? If this man so evil, so wicked, hates God, wants to be in charge, you know there's all kinds of evil taking place in the world. Paul asked the question, why doesn't he go ahead and show himself? And Paul is basically saying, you can already see his footprint. You can already see the force that's behind him. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. You know, you go back to the book of Genesis in chapter uh, 10, I believe it is. Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. He started a, 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 a city, and he, he got everybody to say, look, we're not going to spread out. We're going to make our own city, and we're going to build up a tower to get us to God. We don't need God. We're going to do it ourselves." And, of course, God destroyed that kingdom and called it Babel. And we see the footprint of Babel all through the Old Testament, all the way till it's destroyed in Revelation 17. There is both a political Babylon and there's a religious Babylon. Now, what does that mean to me practically? There is a political force that the devil runs. God doesn't run it. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, but this old world system that we live in is the devil run by the mystery of iniquity. You can, I, I've said this before and made this point, but you, certainly it bears repeating. You, you know, you listen to a news program and you think that the world is so backwards, they're so mixed up. Why do everything that seems good, they, they're opposed to? You, you stop right now and think, people right now are bent out of shape and highly energized, not everybody, but many, a multitude of people are highly energized and bent out of shape about the condition of the earth, climate change. What they claim about climate change is, okay, in our life, probably it's not going to bother us that much. But in so many years, New York City is going to be underwater. And that's a bad thing? No, I mean, I mean you know, it ain't going to bother me, but what about our grandchildren? 
What about future generations? We need to save the earth for future generations. Now listen, the same crowd who is interested in future generations who have not even been conceived would murder a baby that's already been conceived. That doesn't make any sense until you understand the mystery of iniquity. The same person who says, how could you be so bold and audacious to think that just because a man has committed a murder that we as a state should put him to death? That's uncivilized. That's terrible. And the same crowd would murder an unborn baby. Anything that's right, they go away from it. Anything that's wrong, they go toward it. Listen, the masses don't even know why. I'd be in the middle of those masses were it not for Jesus. If it wasn't for the Lord Jesus Christ, I'd be following right along with the mystery of iniquity. It doth already work, but thank God, Jesus came to deliver me from this present evil world. What he says to the believer today, we can't be part of it. We're not going to be crucified with it. We're not going to be uh, condemned with it. We're not going to be put under with it. But he says, love not the world. Don't be conformed to the world. He says, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. So he talks about a definite man. He talks about a mystery. But now here's the point that he's going to get to that I want you to see and we'll be done. He talks to the delivered. He discusses this deceiver. But then he addresses the damned. Now notice if you would in verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The first thing I notice about the damned is there's going to be a deception. The deception, it says he's going to come in the power of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Matthew 24, 24, Jesus said there are going to be false prophets that will come, that if it were possible, they would deceive even the very elect. This man, no doubt, is going to have the power of deception that is supernatural. The world is going to wonder after him. Revelation 9, 3, they're going to say, who's able to make war with this beast? I can only imagine the types of miracles and signs and supernatural things that he's going to do, but you can imagine if he were able to cure disease, if he were able to stop, give world peace, if he were able to step in and negotiate places that have never been negotiated, and he's probably going to receive a deadly womb. Everybody's going to believe he's dead, and he probably will be, and he's going to rise from the dead. People are going to just be amazed. The world is going to be deceived. Now, The problem and the issue and what he says is at at stake here is the truth. The issue is he's going to come in this kind of deceivableness, but look at verse 10 again, with all deceivableness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. See, the issue here is the truth. I do want to turn you quickly, if I can, to Revelation, and I want to go to chapter 9. Can you turn over there? That one's easier to find than Daniel. Right there at the end of your Bible. Just go back to index and start turning left. Revelation chapter 9. Now I'm not going to read a lot of verses, but I want you to get a picture here of one of the woes that comes on this earth and the result that the people of the earth have. The Bible says in Revelation 9 verse 1 that the fifth angel sounded and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. To him was given the key of the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. The sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locust upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth had power. So here are these demonic scorpions that have landed on the earth, and I have no reason to doubt that they will literally be here And they're like scorpions, they're not, but they look like them, they remind you of them, they have a power in their tail. And then go over to chapter 9 and verse 18. By these was the third part of men killed, by fire, by smoke, and by brimstone, which issued out of their mouth, for their power is in their mouth and in their tail. For their tails were like unto serpents, and had heads with them that they do hurt. Now the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, 
yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not, uh, that they should not worship devils, uh, uh, idols of gold, silver, and brass, stone, and of wood, which neither can see, nor hear, nor walk, neither repented thee of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Now here's the point I want you to see, and you can just turn quickly back to 2 Thessalonians as I tell you this. During the time of the tribulation, imagine how it would be, and this was just one glimpse, there's other stuff, but one glimpse, these demonic scorpions fall on the earth and begin to sting people to the point that they gnaw their tongues for pain. They desire to die and death flees from them. A third of the men of the earth are killed with a plague and another huge amount killed with smoke and so forth. All of the people are dying and there's great pain and agony and distress and uh, people would prefer to die and go through it, but they will not. They refuse to repent. You know why? They're deceived. They are deceived and they will not turn to God because they did not receive the truth. You see, the issue during the tribulation, the issue during right now, the issue is always, what will you do with Jesus? You're confronted with the truth. The truth is, you're a sinner separated from God. Oh, I live a good life. I give money to charity. I go to church. I've never murdered anybody. I'm not a drug addict. Well, that's good. You might have a healthier life as a result, but that don't get you a step closer to God. We're sinners. One lie is enough to separate you from God, and Jesus came to bear that sin upon himself. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. The Lord, that's God in heaven, hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now here we sit in this room, and you hear the gospel, and let's say God's Spirit comes down this morning, pricks your heart, and shows you that you're lost, you're headed to hell, you need Christ, He'll take away your sin, He rose from the dead, what will you do with Him, will you receive Him? God will never force you into heaven. He simply offers you an opportunity to receive His Son, not now. I'm not going to do it. Maybe one day, I'll think about it, I'll consider it, but no. Well now go back to 2 Thessalonians. Two passages, two notes here in verse 10. He says, With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Then he explains why. Because they received not the love of the truth. Now, if you were talking about a future event and you were describing it, which he is describing, it would seem like you would say, With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they will receive not the love of the truth. Like, all of this will happen when he comes, and they're going to perish because they will not receive the love of the truth. But notice he switched to a past tense. They received not the love of the truth. Same thing in verse uh, uh, 12. They, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. He even says in verse 11, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Imagine if somebody today, as I just said, God's Spirit dealt in your heart, showed you that you're lost, you realized you needed to be saved, and you said, not now, which is just no. No matter what your intentions are, no. Okay, you received not the love of the truth. Now, God in His grace and mercy may deal with you again tomorrow. He might deal with you again next Sunday. He might deal with you for years because He's a gracious and a loving God, but He doesn't guarantee you that He will. Proverbs 29, 1, He that being often reproved and hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. That means even now, before this ever takes place, you are taking a chance that God would never trouble your heart again, and you'd never receive Christ. But what if you miss the rapture? Now, you're not part of the church. You, you haven't received Christ. You've got every intention of receiving, but the rapture comes. Well, then all hell begins to break loose on this earth. I mean, there's all kinds of havoc. The church is gone. I mean, we've pictured in our mind crashing planes and crashing cars and economic upheaval and so forth. Even if none of that happened, and I think it probably will, if none of that happened, imagine what the world is going to be like with no godly influence whatsoever. It is going to be just one big cesspool. And then you start reading all of these judgments. Now, when you, you say, okay, I've grown up in church. I know about all this uh, tribulation and Jesus coming, the man of sin, the Antichrist, and all of that. Now, I didn't go, 
but my godly friend went. My uh, person that I know is a Christian, they're gone. Man, I notice all these people and they're gone. I'm going to know it. It's the rapture and I missed it. I'm going to tell you the first thing I'm going to do right after that happens. I'm going to get down on my knees and say, God, I know what's coming. I want you to save me. Logically, that's what you would do. The problem is God is going to send you strong delusion. You're going to say, I wonder what happened to all these people. You say, you think that the devil is going to be so powerful that he could convince me of that? The devil's not going to do it. God will send you strong delusion. Now, this to me makes it clear that if a person doesn't receive what God has confronted them with, the gospel, before the rapture, they'll have no opportunity after the rapture. Now, don't just misunderstand me. There's all kinds of people living in America. They've driven by a church. They might even have thrown a gospel track in the garbage can. You might even have mentioned something to them about being saved, but it did, the seed didn't take root. God's spirit didn't work. I don't doubt for a moment that person would have an opportunity to be saved. But if God's dealt with you and you've said no, you have received not the love of the truth. There's been a definite decision not to receive Christ. I don't believe you'll be able to be saved after the rapture. By the way, millions, perhaps billions will be, according to Revelation chapter 7, a multitude that no man could number, responding to the preaching of the gospel of the 144,000, they will be and martyred. But it won't be you if you've rejected the gospel. Now, what happens if you miss the rapture? The man of sin is going to be revealed. God is going to let it go for a short time, and he's going to destroy him with the brightness of his coming. We as believers are going to be gathered together unto him at the marriage feast, and we're going to look back at this little period of the mystery of iniquity and say, how insignificant, how uptight we got over this little thing, how much it bothered us that this little, the devil seemed to be winning for a short time. Here we've got millions and billions of years, and we ain't even got started good in eternity, and God's in control. But you won't be with us if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's have a word of prayer.